Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I am Caleb Nauer, and this is Tassos Alexopoulos. What's going on, man? Hey, what's up, Caleb? How's it going, man? Good, good. That's a, a legit name. I actually did look it up. So <laughs> it is. It actually sounds more authentic Greek than probably my last name does to most people, actually. So we're good. We're good. Cool. So tell people where they can find us in the call to action that you're supposed to do in the beginning of a podcast. Absolutely. Make sure you guys like, listen, or subscribe to this podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Google, or Apple. You choose your favorite platform. Any feedback you guys will give is greatly appreciated too. We want to know what you guys want to hear about. So we're easy to find. Let us know and we will get after it. So speaking of getting after it, we're going to make like a brisket and get to the point. <laughs> <laughs> but so today, actually, we're talking about a little bit of a bummer topic. What we're going to talk about today is shortages, mainly chipset shortages, the chip again that we're in that's kind of leading to the equipment shortages in our industry price increases and some of those um sort of painful yet you know can't get around it kind of things that are going on right now in the industry so we're trying not to be a bummer but we think it's important because we've got a lot of manufacturing insight obviously from who we are but we are so our personal backgrounds lead a lot to give some insight and we think it's really important that folks get a deeper understanding that it's not just our industry it's everyone and you know where these negative things are coming from so we talk about chip shortages. Uh, Tassos, you've got some semiconductor history back a long, long, long time ago, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I worked in the uh, semiconductor industry for a good uh, almost 15 years uh, leading up into jumping into a wireless and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, a lot of the semiconductor uh, factories are, are having issues. You know, there's a huge demand for actually smaller discrete components uh, that is affecting uh, the availability of the lines to produce, you know, some of the higher end chipsets that, that are out there. Um, you know, in Taiwan, there's major droughts in southern Taiwan, which is causing, again, water shortages, which factories consume about 50% of the city's water supply. A lot of people don't know that in order to keep those fabs running and stuff like that. So, yeah, the, the chip shortages isn't just from demand. There's a lot of, uh, you know, nature involved in uh, some of this stuff. And, and, and then you have your standard, you know, supply and demand uh, issues. Yeah, you know, I'm no economist, but the the supply and demand concept is a really simple concept, but it's kind of wild how it really plays out on the global scale, especially what we're facing now, you know, and everyone wants to blame this on the COVID and yeah, the COVID and the lockdowns and everything did have an effect, but it's not just that, you know, there was a huge run up in demand before there were things like, you know, 5g, your favorite topic. Um, but you've got to think, you know, there's all the infrastructure that was needed to be built out for that new devices getting ready for 5g and everything. Um, there's a lot of political things that really messed up the demand curve. So uh, SMIC were like, the states were like, nope, can't buy from there anymore. Huawei got blocked from buying stuff from our fabric. So that caused some issues. The 200 millimeter, the small wafer size, you know, things like that. And there's just a lot of uncertain demand. And, you know, these industries are... You know, you can't just ramp this stuff up. So people were getting nervous. So there was a lot of stockpiling and uncertainty before. Uh, and then. Yeah, I mean, definitely. So um, it's, it's kind of like the perfect storm, <laughs> you know, really when you think about it. Right. So, you know, we, we kind of had the shortages from COVID. So everybody was falling behind in their deliverable. So everybody ramped up to two, three, sometimes four X what they normally would. So this really stressed, stressed the line. And then we had this kind of like uh, demand on top of that, right? You talk about all this government funding, right? All of a sudden, all this money went out and everybody's like, hey, I could buy 10x what I used to be able to buy. So the orders even, you know, doubled and tripled on top of that, right? So you really have all these things happening on top of each other that's just uh, creating this this really paradigm shift right in how industries as a whole you know plan and distribute their products globally i mean then that you know trickles down to shipping right so there's not enough containers the lines are all congested and then you know uh, we go into customs brokerage and storage i mean man it's just it's just crazy crazy how everything just came together and and started just piling on top of each other and creating all the problems we were seeing right now 
for sure. You know, they were like, oh, the factory shut down, but they're back open, so we should be able to crank. We're like, well, they were at capacity, and they continue to be at capacity. I mean, they're still putting out additional capacity what they could before. They're on a full board now, but there's just so much catch-up. And you think about the consumer demand. You know, everyone working from home, so you got your little nuclear family, and you're trying to work from home, and little Bobby and little Timmy won't shut the hell up unless you buy them a brand new iPad so they can play their games or go to school, wink, wink, or whatever that is. So you've got people that have money because they're not going on vacation. So the consumer demand blew up, and there's just so many chips that shifted that um, even work from home stuff, peripherals, webcams. I mean, we couldn't get webcams for months. So. I remember that. It took us forever. I mean, I had to wait like three months in order to get a 720p webcam. And, you know, it's the best <laughs> you can get. It was a Logitech for like 50 bucks, you know? Crazy. It's- so yeah, the the COVID definitely has some bad effects. There was a lot of bad luck and stuff. I mean, some really kind of crappy things happened last year. Um, it got a little chilly in Texas, and the yeah. whole state kind of shut down. <laughs> Yeah, we had our winter storm, which, you know, went and shut down our power grids and we had all sorts of uh, problems, which now makes, you know, government agencies, municipalities looking into their infrastructure and they need to upgrade things. I mean, it's again, uh, it's just it's crazy how it piles up. And I mean, we're we kind of barely recovered from that. It seemed for like a little while the past few months, things seem to be somewhat normal again. But now we have Christmas coming around. The holidays is here. Right. So, you know, the consumer products are going to go through the roof to demand for that stuff and it's just uh you know i i don't know uh how we get out of it i think it's just time is all we need i mean i know it will smoothen out over time it's just really hard to tell like when <laughs> when that's gonna happen i, I mean I, I don't think anybody knows now but uh, i mean we could be seeing stuff like this for the next year or two at least i think 18 months easily at, at least so i mean and people don't realize so you shut down the fabers in texas i mean texas is sort of you know where most of our semiconductor fab in the States happens. So they're like, well, they were only shut down three days because they didn't have power. I'm like, well, that's still 1%. And when you when your demand is 120%, you can't get one. Eh, it doesn't work out. So Yeah, absolutely. And then you get the rolling blackouts in California, right? A lot of the factories are still there as well, right? A lot of the design. I mean, you know, this also pushed back, you know, a lot of uh, companies, even including ourselves, right, as far as uh, development and release of new products, right? So it's it's hard enough to try and maintain and get the output uh, from the company back to normal for your existing product line. But, you know, we're always thinking two, three years out and we have products that need to roll out. If, if the contract manufacturers can't build your current product line, how are they going to fire up and, you know, build the, uh, build the uh, inventory and get your new products out to market so uh, again there's there's a lot of that involved uh with i'm sure you know pretty much every company that's out there you know new products are are a thing you know and and they need to be able to uh you know ramp that up while they continue to uh, continue producing their legacy product line for sure so and you, you know you talk about the capacity and you talk about the planning so i was doing a little research found actually a really cool bloomberg article that if we remember we'll put it in the description somewhere it's got some cool infographics showing how you know 91 some odd percent of chipset manufacturing happens in asia and a big chunk of that is in taiwan with tsmc uh and then samsung in south korea obviously so Poking around, you know, they're at max capacity. I found some really interesting numbers, though. So Apple is something like 25% of the end product that TSMC is making. Now, TSMC is making, you know, chips for things like um, Qualcomm, right, who are making the wireless chipsets. Broadcom making Ethernet chips and, you know, Xami and, like, all these others, right? But if you add it all up, Apple's like 25%. And they've got, you know, some $300 billion laying around that they can afford to sort of lock down that production so now let's contrast that or or you look at something so like Qualcomm right chipset manufacturer um Apple is roughly 11 percent of Qualcomm's output right or revenue excuse me uh they actually showed ubiquity in the list ubiquity is 0.1 percent so if you've got Apple who's 10 percent and Samsung was another 10 percent and Zamy was another 10 percent you've got those huge numbers versus a relatively big player in our industry for sure with 0.1 percent you can see well there's the delta and we can't sling our weight around that an Apple could or a Samsung or something like that 
Yeah, I think sometimes people, you know, uh, you kind of get uh, locked into your particular market, right? So when we're, you know, we're thinking through the Wisp's mind, right? So we think, you know, Cambium, uh, Ubiquity, and and so on. You know, they're the big boys, right? They they've got you know billion dollars, and you know they could push their weight around. But really, when you think about the grand scheme of things, I mean, it's really peons compared to the the really huge <laughs> monsters that that are out there. And I mean, and and you have. Uh, you know, companies now who weren't really equipment manufacturers. I mean, look at Amazon, right? Amazon putting out those ring cameras and all the other uh, electronic gadgets now that they're they're building demand for for things that uh, really weren't a thing just a few years ago. Cars, right? Yeah, everybody thinks about the cars. They think, oh, with the ECU, right? You think about the brain. That's like as far as it really goes. But you think of the you know infotainment systems that they have in there, all the other uh, gadgets that go with it now. You know, to to give them you know three hundred and sixty degree view around the vehicle and proximity. You got all these all these different things. I mean, every part of your life is getting dominated now with more and more technology, and uh, they all require chips and yeah there's really a limited supply of factories to make them and it takes years it takes uh, at least a year and a half to two years to build a new semiconductor factory so uh, again with them ramping up now and and breaking ground uh, like samsung is talking about now building another factory in, in taylor texas now right but maybe two years before that thing's up you know qualified and, and actually pushing product out the door man so yeah it's a lot there's a lot behind that stuff yeah, there's a lot of political pressure right now to onshore, um, which is the cool new term that's going around right now. But yeah, you know, Intel's got a plant where they're going to start doing their own third party uh, manufacturing for folks and everything. But you know, they're like, well, it'll be ready in 2024. And then you're also gotten this concern too, because they're like, okay, let's say this all flattens out in a couple of years. I've just spent $20 billion with a new fab plant. And if I can't run it at capacity, then this is going to kill us. So. You know, those, yeah. those whipsaw effects of supply and demand, whether it's with the fabrics themselves, the contract manufacturers, like you talk about, you know, contract manufacturers are making a huge majority of the equipment in our field. Not everyone has their own factory and they have to get in line. Well, if their chips aren't there to do one part of it, they can't run the product. You have to have it all. So now you're like, well, we're bumping you. Oh, your stuff finally came in. Well, I can't build this for you tomorrow. We're going to schedule you in three weeks because we can crank stuff we've got in our hands right now. And these delays and this whipsaw effect of this uh, supply and demand jerking around like this is really causing these cascading delays in what's available. So it's it's yeah. it's a murky, muddy mess to watch happen. So Yeah, and it's, and it's that offshoring that happened over a decade ago. I mean, that's why I'm in the wireless business now, right? It was, you know, almost 15 years ago, I was working for Applied Materials, and I was, you know, one of the equipment manufacturers, right, for... Uh, the semiconductor factories, and I did a lot of travel in Asia at GSMC, which was in China, in Shanghai. Their uh, uh, you know government subsidized you know foundries basically at TSMC as well, and it's, it's basically. I saw at that time that our industry was shrinking here because everything was getting offshored to Asia, basically, and all the factories here in the U.S. were slowing down. And I was just like, ah, no bueno, you know, I got to do something else because it's, <laughs> it's not going to be around. So I jumped ship, you know, I jumped into wireless and here I am 15 years later. And it's funny to see it now shifting. People are like, oh, well, that was a bad idea. I mean, we knew that was a bad idea back then. But, you know, again, you know, we, we weren't the ones, uh, you know, paying the shareholders, I guess. So we had no say, you know, and, uh, you know, it's it's good. It's good to see it coming back. Um, and, and it's good to see, uh, unfortunately, maybe a little short that, you know, people are seeing the short sightedness that they had back then as far as national security and stuff like that. Because I remember we were talking about it. it's like, you know, we're going to have, you know, some Chinese factory or some Taiwanese factory make, you know, these, you know, kind of super secret chips for, you know, our fighter jets and stuff like that. I mean, we have to keep something here in the U.S. And I mean, the factories are here, obviously, but uh, I mean, the majority of the stuff just went offshore and uh, just totally disrupted it. Now I mean, you have to re-educate and uh, rebuild the workforce for it, right? Because a lot of those guys, like myself, have moved on to other things. You know what I mean? So <laughs> and we we really had a good system 10, 15 years ago. You know, uh, the semiconductor industry as a whole. 
uh, was you know well educated. Uh, the you know the the people the the workforce right was you know thinking about this is could be my future. This is what I want to do. And and we've stopped that now. They moved on to other things. And so it's going to take some time to build that up as well. So I suspect when the factories come online, hey, all of a sudden you know employee shortage right is going to be a problem because they're not going to have qualified people to to man them all. So it'll take time for that as well. Yeah, it's definitely a 10, 20 year plan. And like you said, it is a huge national security issue as well. So, you know, TMC putting out so much stuff and, you know, the potential of China reaching over there and going, yoink, this is ours now. It's kind of terrifying, but we'll see. It could be a gold rush. So any of you kids out there that are about 10 now, uh, 10, 12, thinking about your long-term plans, think about that fab life. So it could be a very lucrative career growing up. So it is, it really is. Um, but it's like I said, it's painful, and we see these things on the list all the time. Uh, one important thing to note, though, it's not that they can't make anything. Like the manufacturers on our field are still making a ton of products, and you can see Ubiquity and Cambium and now Airspan, uh, Aviat. You know, these are public companies, and you can look and see what their sales are, what their revenues are. So, from our perspective, it looks like they can't make anything, or they're making five, ten percent of what they can normally make. But then, when you look at the revenue numbers and the output, you're like, no, they're they're running record numbers pretty much every quarter. It's just that the demand is higher than the supply. And that butter gets spread a little thin, and when it does, you know, we we all feel a lot of pain from that for sure. Yep, definitely, definitely. And then you have to wonder, it's like, you know, at some point they, you know, they they kind of overordered, right? Because they saw the demand building, and then once they start seeing, you know, the the demand kind of taper off, maybe they pull back, you know, and and maybe they pull back too far, right? And and things could get thrown off as well. So it's it's a slippery slope. It's uh, it's it's a, a thing you have to juggle and uh, you have to learn through. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't think this industry has been through anything like this before, right? Or the world in in uh, when it really comes down to it, but. But uh, we'll, we'll figure it out, I'm sure. And, and in the end, like I said, uh, things will be okay. But uh, it's, it's still going to be another year or two. You know, I mean, geez, you know, now we'll talk about you know pricing and stuff like that. There's a whole another whole another bag to talk about, right? Yeah. So you know, again, a lot of it comes down to supply and demand, and that drives pricing. So that's one of the core tenets of international economics or economics in general. So. You know, nobody wants to raise prices. You know, unfortunately, we did. We put out the announcement a couple months ago, and this was a decision that was very, very tough to make. But in the end, you know, these short-term hikes and stuff, we can get through that. You know, that's fine. But when you're talking about long-term, multi-year cycle where your prices are hiked and might not come back down, like that's not sustainable in the long term, unfortunately. So yeah, and I and I knew in, in like in for obviously I can only speak for ourselves, right? So I mean, we watched the price go up and up and up and we thought you know that okay it's going to plateau and actually it did during covid uh back in like mid 2020 it kind of plateaued we're like all right cool you know we're we're at a stable price now things will probably start pulling back and get cheaper and then all of a sudden boom for some reason the end of the year came uh right around kind of the election cycle like october november or something and stuff started going up again and, and it really still hasn't stopped i mean geez container prices are just just uh, just ridiculous what you to cost two thousand dollars to ship is now you know close to twenty thousand dollars that that you know that's a lot of money uh and it really depends in kind of you know because uh, it's all about weight and volume and stuff right so you know if you if you're shipping a container that only has can only fit 200 pieces of something in there at twenty thousand, that's that's a lot when you do the math on that right if you can stuff that container with you know ten thousand items yeah all right maybe it's only two bucks a piece you know but uh either way i mean it, it all adds up at some point it really does and that's you know the the shipping cross hike that is hitting the end product i mean that there's a huge number but you know it, it applies to a lot of things too right so shipping costs are so high that they can't china can't import a lot of the wood and paper and stuff or recyclables they used to buy all of our recycled cardboard would recycle it and then use it to print stuff like instruction manuals right the little pamphlets we throw in there <laughs> don't now get we're me seeing, started on that 
<laughs> Dude, the price of that went through the roof. And you're like, okay, well, it's a couple bucks. Well, a couple of bucks at manufacturer level, then it mm-hmm. goes to what they're charging us to manufacture, then what we've got to charge. And these sort of cost increases at the beginning cascade out because that's how the the math of this works. So, you know, it's one thing to be like, well, plastic resin is higher cost. Uh, aluminum's higher cost just because of demand and the supply. Well, now how many container loads of bauxite have to be moved around so you can take it to the smelter and then pump up? to make the aluminum and just it really cascades so i think people people see things on the news oh the price of steel is up you know 50 percent or 100 percent or something but don't realize how that cascades across the entire product line you know not just us but everybody and where that jumps up so it's yeah. it's painful for sure yeah and, and if you think i mean like sometimes you know people could be short-sighted too you look at the you know the, the price of steel as as you mentioned right so it goes up x percent whatever it is so you think okay well well you know the that means that the raw material of my product that's made of metal should only go up but you have to think you know all the machines that make your product are made out of steel right and you know you can't really keep up with all this demand with the current factory that you have right i mean so these contract manufacturers have to build new factories which take steel they have to buy new machines that are made out of steel right so all these prices you know start to compound on top of each other and it's not you know it's not like hey so the the raw material cost is up 50 percent but you know the 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 guy who makes this you know the product for the contract manufacturer has to make a product profit which goes into it you know the guy who sells the steel for the factory that you're building has to make a profit so that goes on top of it and all trickles down so by the time you you're talking about the cost of the steel for your particular product, you got to put all the cost of building those new factories into it as well. So it really goes up a lot more than just what you see as that, you know, stamp yeah, 10% up this month. You know, it really doesn't work that way. It compounds because of everything else that's involved in getting you that product. I mean, even the molds, right? The die cast molds, you know, they're made out of metal, you know, so it's, it's crazy. There's, there's a lot involved. And then let's say you actually get a product made and you can afford it and you ship it and you pay out the nose for shipping. The the delays are really killing us too. Cause it used to be, you know, you call up, Hey, I need a container from China to wherever, you know, Savannah or whatever. Okay, cool. You know, we'll come pick it up next week. But now we're having to schedule four to six weeks out for pickup for literally for them to come pick up. And they're like, well, we can bump you ahead, but it's going to cost this much more Then they get on the ships and it gets to the port. The demand is hiked and we're having workflow shortages and stuff. Stuff. So now you can't get stuff through the port and you get it through the port uh, and there's no truckers because that industry is all jacked up. So we eventually get everything here. Uh, and the downside is it's taken a lot longer. It's gotten a lot more expensive and it drives to the shortage. And this ends up being a snake eating its tail at some point because you're paying more to ship stuff by air freight. Well, now the air freight's all full. So what do you do there? This is why Amazon has decided they're building their own airline now, right? Because yeah. they, they're like, we can't afford to, to move stuff on ground. So we're going to move a lot more by air. So it's, it's and fascinating. They can't, afford, they can't afford to pay the middleman, right? They can't afford to pay, even though they got great rates through UPS because of all the volume that they were doing. And they tried to subsidize some of that using a USPS for some of those short ship or local, local delivery type things. Things. I mean, again, that that all goes to the bottom line and what it costs the consumer, and they're going to try and trim that as much as they can, you know. For sure, for sure. So this is kind of a, a painful thing, and you know, this confluence of factors coming together. You know, everyone again keeps blaming COVID, but it's not. That was the the last slap. But I mean, there were a lot of there were a lot of slaps before that. So we end up with this sort of uh, perfect storm of shenanigans and pain. But you know. Yeah. What do you do, right? Like, you can wish it away, but that's not going to work, obviously. So <laughs> I tried. I tried. It didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> you tried drinking a lot, yelling at the sky. I don't know. It hadn't really seemed to help, but I feel a lot better. But, you know, so what do you do? Realistically, what it comes down to is long-term planning, right? You know, a lot of folks, especially in the industry, you know, it's hard for them to plan long-term. They don't have the capital or they're growing too hard or too fast, and it's hard to plan for that and everything. I mean, I, I totally get it, you know? So the manufacturers can ramp their production and they can move as much product as they can. But in the end, the end users, the WISPs and the integrators and stuff have got to work on the long-term plan and understand these issues are not going away. They're probably not going away for the next year or two. Who knows, right? So 
you've got to think about strategy and your deployments. You've got to think about relationships. You know, this is all business, but so much of business is tied to relationships. So things Absolutely. like, you know, you're not going to be able to go, Oh, I need some APs. Well, let me, who's got some, right? Like these APs, so much of the equipment now is already spoken for. So this is where it's really important to form solid relationships with the, the channel, you know, your distributors, your vendors, your resellers, whoever you're working with and get a plan, you know, get your name in there, get some things on back order. Um, even your out. fellow wisps, even your fellow wisps. I mean, I've seen uh, talk, you know, on, on uh, different chat, you know, chat groups that I'm in or on the actual Facebook groups and stuff and people calling out, Hey, I have this, I need this. And, you know, somebody's like, well, I over ordered. And so I have some, I could share with you uh, some of the stuff and also to, to look at what are your uh, kind of, you know, technology uh, options as well. I mean, we've talked about this before uh, on the show, right? You know, you you may, you know, you may want, you know, X product, right? But, you know, Y is kind of available. Y kind of works. You know, something is better than nothing. So uh, for, for a lot of this stuff, you have to look at what your other options are because there are products out there that are, let's say, less desirable than other ones, but they, they may fit the bill for a little while to try and get you through, right? I mean, this is is not a long-term fix, um, but it's really about, you know, getting your business going and, and keeping it running, you know, and getting, you know, uh, new subscribers added to your network and, and trying to build out, you know, whatever new infrastructure you can for when things do return to kind of normal again, uh, you'll be, you'll be ready for it, you know? So you have to look at things like that. Yeah, for sure. You know, have secondary tertiary deployment plans and, you know, try to avoid vendor lock where you can, uh, except for your antennas. Antennas definitely are of elements. Uh, we do have the benefit of not being an active device. Um, and, you know, when, when the big spike hit last year, I wasn't here, but, you know, I saw it from my side in the distribution channel. You know, the big spike when, when COVID hit and everyone went to work from home and everyone ramped up internet service, you know, that, that took a lot of people off, off by, you know, we're like, oh my God, what do we do? So, but everyone thought it would just be a spike and then drop back down, but that's not really the case. Like it's, it spiked and then stayed high and it's, it's high yeah. now it's high everywhere. So especially with so much investment from tax dollars and everything going in these networks, like the, the demand is not going to go down anytime soon. And the supply is somewhat inelastic. So you've got to make plans and, you know, come up with some alternatives, but you know, it's part of it, part of doing business. And if we all work hard and work together, we're going to get through this. Absolutely. hundred percent, hundred percent. Totally on board with that. So anyways, try not to be too much of a bummer on a Friday, but like I said, we wanted to throw a little color on it and just, you know, this is what we see. We're here. We feel your pains too. Uh, if there's any way we can help out, let us know. But in the meantime, uh, I've got a dentist appointment coming up here shortly, which is definitely how I want to spend my Friday afternoon. So, <laughs> <laughs> woo! You got anything interesting you. going on? Uh, no, uh, nothing, nothing really going on. Uh, you know, this is uh, my birthday uh, today. Happy so, birthday to, you. to me, yay! You're 34, so, you know, right? Than, yeah, 30, exactly. Yes, I'm 34 again. <laughs> Uh, so other than I'm sure some kind of surprise dinner or something like that that's going to happen today. I'm really planning for a, a, my birthday weekend to be chill. I actually haven't cooked a brisket in months, believe it or not. It's been a while and I, I actually have, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this on the air or not, but I, I have this brisket that I bought like during COVID, you know, when brisket shortages were there. So it's been sitting in the <laughs> freezer out of the ranch for pretty much almost a year, <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm just like, I, I, I got to thaw that thing out. We got to cook it soon you know so uh yeah i think i'll be doing my first brisket this weekend so i'm kind of excited about that so definitely hanging out by the pool drinking some beers cooking some barbecue that's my weekend plan or my birthday weekend plan very awesome that's an excellent way to spend it i have very similar plans my wife's birthday is coming up we're working on her big her big meal so she likes those giant snow or uh king crab legs and stuff so we'll do those on the smoker i'm very excited about that our, our little splurge there so yeah our wives would get along they she loves she loves uh you know crab legs and stuff like that as well so good well she used to not but then she was like oh let me try yours and now she always steals from mine so i'm like nah, yeah get your own woman so be gone it's just too much work for me it's too much work for me you know it's kind of like you know eating uh crawfish and stuff like that it's like all that work to kind of you know break it open and get this little piece of meat out of there it's like why it's like you know give me a steak i just want to pick it up and just take a big bite that's why i like lobster lobster is like you get this big tail you get that big chunk of meat out of there you're good to go but i have to crack every leg and dig in there and get all that stuff out. i'm just not interested man now 
if you want to do it for me and just give me a big old plate of crab meat and some butter, I'm down. I'm down. I don't know. I'm big enough. I could eat almost infinite supply of crab if it was being fed to me. So it slows me down. Eventually, I get full and bored, and I'm, I'm not broke. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. Uh, you can find us uh, on the same places you can always find us. So RF Elements Facebook groups. Uh, we're on Wiz Talk a lot. Caleb at RFElements.com. Toss us at RFElements.com. Reach out, like, share, subscribe, download, please. And let us know what you guys want to hear us talk about. So until next time, we will holler at y'all later. Stay horny, everybody. All right. Stay horny, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>